what you're about to see was maybe the second or third time I had Daniel Garner of OG Rose on the channel. This was for an epic marathon live stream, which is why I'm publishing it here as a standalone video for people who feel intimidated by, you know, like 100 hour long live streams. So, I mean, if you want to go check that out, it, the playlist for that is on the front page of the YouTube channel for Theory Underground. But no, I wanted you to be able to see this as a standalone or listen to it on the podcast because it's available there as well. We had a great conversation about capital, time, energy. Uh, it was Zalouz's birthday, so we talk a little bit about that. And I think the maybe the most important thing, honestly, is just the whole conversation about reading. We have to have a theory about reading if we are to succeed at becoming literate in the 21st century, the age of distraction. And so with that, I'm about to turn it over, but make sure to stick around until the end, smash the like button, subscribe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, yeah, if you stick around to the end, you'll get to see the new PSA that I made. Yeah. Cool. Peace. And we're live. Welcome, Daniel of OG Rose. So good to have you. How's it going, man? It is a pleasure. I am doing well, gentlemen. It's good to see you. So I, you know, I understand it's Deleuze's birthday. So I was going through my kids' toys and I found this body without organs. You can squeeze it. It's like a body without organs. I was going to set him on my shoulder as a parrot, but I didn't have a rubber band. I also have Grace's kitten. So I have two bodies without organs in celebration for Deleuze. Very happy about that. And um, I've, it's a pleasure to be here, gentlemen. I have to say, again, I, I finished the series, um, caught up last night on the on the value theory, labor theory, Henrik and everything with Mose and really enjoyed it. And I think it, it actually has inspired me. Um, I've been thinking for a long time on how to think Leibniz and Marx together, where for Leibniz, we can only have intelligibility when we take into consideration geometry and situation. He talks about the analysis of Sittas. And I think basically also that's what you kind of see coming into question. Like we're always, our intelligibility is always situated. We are in a situation of capital or markets, which then we interpret all experience through. But you see, since we naturally understand in terms of algebra, if you will, points, not situations, we don't notice the entire situation because the brain works by translating things into points, which then makes you think that reality is points. So then you lose the entire network of intelligibility that is keeping you from experiencing. And it makes me think too, like I know you talk about Heidegger and kind of getting to the grounds of intelligibility itself. What ends right. up happening is socialization works basically by cutting us off from the grounds of intelligibility because it's terrifying. And then what it does is our brain by naturally bringing algebraic makes us then lose sight of that situation. So we don't realize we're cut off from that grounds of intelligibility. So then we're just intelligent. Uh, as we reduce everything to various exchange values or use values or algebraic values that don't require us to take into account the entire situation. Um, so I really, I've been enjoying that very much and it's a pleasure to be here today, gentlemen. <laughs> so good to have you. Yeah, this I so are you saying that you get that thing about points uh from Leibniz? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And you know, so Mr. Leibniz in his great debate with Descartes, which we can see is almost a debate between um geometry and, and algebra. And uh what, what Leibniz is kind of warning is that when I talk about the number two. Uh, I'm always talking about two things. There is no number two in reality. That is a abstract idea that arises from two phenomena that gives me a kind of model by which to understand reality. But I must never forget that it's not actually in reality. If I actually, for some reason, come to think that the number two is reality, then I'm inherently set up for what? A reductionism, a sort of reducing everything. And that's also what Marx is talking about when he talks about kind of the abstract notion of human labor. There's some sort of human labor as value that is behind everything but then you end up reducing everything to that human labor and then marx is kind of like um guys what what is that <laughs> what's this labor thing you're talking about but there's a reductionism and so what leibniz is warning is like hey um we have to remember that all intelligibility is situated i'm never dealing with just a point i am always dealing with an entire plane an entire situation and if you don't realize that then you lose sight of the fact that intelligibility is always um a result of some degree of human involvement so because what do we do with like the number two we go oh two is two regardless if there's a human regardless if there's anyone involved right 
Well, Leibniz comes along and he's like, well, you know, actually, um, the very act of intelligibility always has a human element involved. And what ends up happening is if you lose sight of that, because the human is always in the situation that makes intelligibility possible, then you actually will disown the human involvement, which actually there still is a human involvement. So now you have a pathology. You're going to say, oh, well, you know, the numbers are just there. Oh, it's kind of like you were talking about where you read the Bible and you don't acknowledge interpretation. Well, when you do that, you end up in trouble because what Leibniz is warning, he's like, by thinking that algebra is more primary or essential than geometry, you are basically saying there's a possibility of escaping interpretation. Well, then there's a whole lot of work that you don't have to do as a human being because you can just have the numbers give it to you. What he wants to say is that algebra, it is not that geometry is built out of algebra. It is that algebra is a reduction or a, a kind of a reduction of geometry. And likewise, what Marx wants to kind of point out is he says, you know, human, the abstract notion of human labor is a reduction of actual human labor into a notion that's kind of naked, but you are able to imagine it is there. Therefore, it is able to have an authority over you, which then you then disown your involvement in the creation of that authority, which creates pathology, right? So likewise, what we do is we take geometry, reduce it to algebra. Then we say algebra is more essential to geometry, which then we disconnect our involvement in the algebra, then make it have authority over us. And now something reductionistic, reductionistic has authority over us, which then, of course, removes the possibility of us coming to terms with the origin or basis of intelligibility, because we're not part of it. So, you know, there is no um, there is no origin of intelligibility. There's just intelligibility. Crap. Mm. Well, now we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. then. That's when compression I was become flattening. So Leibniz, I think, is very important. Um, I think the, the analysis of Sittas is an incredible work. Everything I know about Leibniz, I um, I owe to the great Anthony Morley, who wrote a tremendous book on um, on Leibniz that can be found on Amazon. I highly suggest it. And um, and he talks about basically is he makes the example where he asks the question of if of what is sameness? Because if you think about it. Nothing in reality is the same, right? You know, it always has a little bit of difference, right? But he says sameness is, the, is a way to describe something that you can confuse as something else if it's not in the same situation. So he talks about two temples that are completely identical. And they're identical because you wouldn't know which was which if you were just inside of them, okay? In order to tell that they're different temples, you have to bring it to what he calls the same situation then you can see they're different because they're brought together, right? And it's either in the same mental state or it's the same geometrical space. But then what ends up happening is sameness is unveiled as similarity. But the funny thing about similarity is that it means there's a difference, right? So the weird thing is where is similarity located? Where is this similar that you're talking about, right? It's in the relation that you are identifying between the two different phenomena. This brings to mind what Marx is saying about equivalence and um, relational. You know, when you suddenly bring to that, you're like, oh, the linen is the same as the coat and you bring them together into the same situation. Where is this similarity between the linen and the coat that you're talking about? Where would you find this? When they're apart, it's easier to see them as exchangeable. Then you bring them together and you go, oh, these equal one another. Marx is basically asking, where does that equal sign come from? Like, where did the equal yeah. sign come from? This this Stanley yeah, <laughs> this Stanley mug is the same price as this book, this underground theory book, like on Amazon. I'm just guessing, but you know, they're about the same price. What? You know, you hold them up yeah. to each other and it, it gets weird and disorienting, right? Well, the key is as Leibniz is asking, where does the equal sign come from? So Marx is asking, where does the equal sign come from? Because every equal sign unveils that they're not equal, that they're only similar. The very act of identifying sameness, which is the equal sign, is the act of showing they're not the same, which is really freaking weird. Because, you know, and Alex Ebert also in the Hegel anthology was talking about how in mathematics there's this debate, apparently, I, I'm not an expert in the field, where they're debating if they should equal. get rid of the equal sign and replace it with equivalence because there really is no equal sign. Well, that's kind of what Marx is getting at. And he's suggesting that in order to create an equal sign that is not there, we have to treat things according to an abstract idea of labor where we say, oh, well, they're equal because of labor. 
Really? Uh, you know, so two hours of like uh, typing on a computer screen is worth eight hours of working on a car. Where does that judgment come from? Here's the key. Um, to cut ahead, Leibniz wants to say that all intelligibility requires a human judgment. You have to judge a similarity. And ultimately, he's saying that all metaphysics is basically the art of judging similarity. Is saying these are somehow similar. So likewise, in order to create the logic of capital, you have to find a similarity in phenomenon that actually is not there, but that you judge is there so that then they are intelligible to you, right? Well, here's the trick. That means human beings are the grounds of intelligibility in an act of judgment that they forget they have because they come to treat the price as objective beyond them, as not something that they are in. It just has that value. It just has that price. But actually, there's a relationship that it is necessary to be judged. But if that is the case, that means the human being is an active participant in the act of intelligibility, that then they disown their active involvement in treating capital as objective beyond them. Now, Marx points out that the only way abstract ideas have this kind of authority is if they have an objective manifestation in the real world that then can facilitate the idea back and forth, back and forth. All of this creates a what? a situation. That's what Leibniz is saying. All intelligibility is a result of a situation between the abstract and the concrete that are con completely in a feedback loop with one another, which then, and then I'll pass it back to you, when the human realizes this, now we've opened up the possibility of the grounds of intelligibility. Now we go, wait a minute, I organize myself in the world according to the manner by which I judge it. Why do I judge it this way versus another way? Capital versus, say, time energy, totalitary versus infinite or different things. Now all of that has been opened up. But to, uh, to the defense of capital, one of the reasons we do this is because human beings are horrified by the abyssal. Like the moment you say, oh, I have an active role in the very means of intelligibility, then you have to ask yourself the question, why do I judge it X way versus Y way? And that requires all of the sort of anxiety that results of that, which then gets into why it's important to say, read books the way you do, because you get used to not knowing, not understanding what's going on, training yourself due to that effort and working through that, which basically suggests that being open to the origin of intelligibility requires practices like reading books or different things like that. So I think it can help to, um, to look at Marx in terms of Leibniz, the situation, analysts of Sittas, and to bring those kind of things together, because then you can see the entire situation that is an operation. Amazing. Okay, so I want to back it up here. I want to say, first of all, that, uh, you know, this sounds like a, an excellent piece that you're working on, maybe multiple pieces, maybe it'll be a book, maybe it'll maybe it'll be something you submit to the value form anthology coming together in the October conference, you know, here at Theory Underground. Now, it's definitely welcome if you would want to do that. It sounds amazing. I like the way that you bring it together with Heidegger in terms of intelligibility, the background conditions of intelligibility, because when you're saying that everything's reduced to points, uh, through this compression that is reductive. Um, I'm I'm thinking, of course, fallingness. We're thrown into fallingness, which is to say, taking our being to be present at hand. We're taking uh, what we are at our most base level to be, pretty much be objects, right? It's a sort of objectification through compartmentalization, through uh, what he says. Uh, he says we we. We, we think that we could get, get an idea of the whole through this sort of piecemeal assembling of facts, right? And these facts are, of course, of ready-to-hand or non-ready-to-hand situations. A, a non, sorry, present-in-hand, I said ready-to-hand. But what I mean is like, a, you know, so when I say non-present-in-hand, it's like, oh, well, that's not there, therefore it's not real. You know, maybe it was, but now it's not. Uh, as opposed to, oh, that is there, that, therefore that is real. Right. And so we just take that to be the kind of the law of of realness and value. Uh, and of course, what gets foreclosed is us, our being in the world, our entire the fact that we are responsible for that rendering intelligible and that we are uh, ontologically different and distinct from, say, these other objects that I'm waving around in the room because these objects are not responsible for holding open and maintaining the 
that responsible mode of comportment towards the world, towards others, right? And and really rendering it intelligible, like disclosing. So it's like we're always in t- disclosing, we're always rendering intelligible. We always have some idea of what's right or wrong or what's better or worse, or but we don't take responsibility for that, right? And of course, there's at some point in everyone's life when there might be opportunities to. And you can make choices along that way, along that road. And, and sometimes it's not even a choice. Uh, maturity can be forced on somebody in a sort of sense. Um, but there is always, in some, in some sense, an actual taking over interpretation. The book does not read itself to you. You are reading it and you come to it with a whole world of equipment. And if you haven't spent a lot of time surfacing that equipment and then trying to think, oh, is that those presuppositions, are they convenient? Are they self-congratulatory? Do they let me off the hook from actually having to wrestle with this? Is it just a way of simplifying it and putting it back into little boxes so that I can totalize it, as Levinas would say? Well then, it's not going to really amount to much. It'll feel good in the moment, but what's the long-term payout? Probably not good, right? And so this is Last time we had you on, you talked about reading and different ways of reading. And so I want to get into reading a little bit more. I want to talk a little bit about reading. You've been following along with Capital Mondays. You gave me a, a, a comment on that that was so long, I couldn't screenshot it and send it to Nance. And then I was going, oh, I'll just do it from the desktop and then I'll just do it that way. And then I, I never actually got it to him. Nance, did you see it? No? Okay, so we'll get to that in a minute, but I wanted to give Nance an opportunity to say some things because you were talking to Nance uh, prior to uh, going live, and he never got a chance to even respond to you, Um, and I don't even know what he was going to say. I don't even know if it relates without you kind of restating what you had already said, but I kind of wanted to give him an an opportunity here. No, I I think, uh, so we were talking about effort and how um, this contradictory notion of excellence without effort, how that kind of covers up, um, conditions of, of possibility of, of, of things. And I think with social media, it gets especially bad because things are just presented as like, Oh, here's this thing for your consumption. And, and it always covers up, um, the origin of these things. And I think it does go hand in hand, um, definitely with Heidegger and and with Leibniz. Um, and it's exciting. The last couple of days I've been trying to write, um, about chapter three of being in time, which we'll be going over this Saturday. Division um, two, division two, yeah, divi- division two, chapter three. Um, and I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, I guess, this idea of co-responsibility um, and how we have to acknowledge our own co-responsibility, but we also have to be aware of, of um, others and their responsibility for, what we're seeing so when we see excellence but we see the the concealed effort or the the attempts to conceal the effort uh i think that's a particularly malicious ideological operation that's happening um and yeah i i don't know leibniz i definitely need to read some leibniz i've been wanting to read for a while now we've we've been talking about it and we haven't gotten around to it but now we have even more reason to do so well, marvelous. So a, f- a few things. First off, I like to actually imagine that Raypoint, um, your book Waypoint is reading itself to me on the new audio aud- aud- audible. So, you know, uh, but I but I love that point that you're you're saying. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, so first off, um I think there's a weird way where perhaps on this idea that we want there's almost a way in which we want things to be algebraic and points, because then we understand them without effort, because our brain just naturally gets it. And there's a way in which, you know, in Christianity, you talk about the virgin birth. It's almost like we want virgin greatness where it's just there it, and the boy ex nihilo. And likewise, we want things to just ex nihilo be fully understood. Now, I think this aligns with, frankly, the pleasure principle. And Cadell at the month of libido at Philosophy Porter was talking about how the brain is always sexed in the sense that it's always seeking pleasure. And one of the reasons we're prone to algebra is because algebra is pleasurable. It's pleasurable to understand. I understand this bookcase. Oh, I understand that there is either greatness or not 
not a complicated process of sacrifice, life and time that brings an entire situation that's harder to understand, involves risk and all other factors. No, 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 no. There's just virgin greatness. It's just ex nihilo, baby. So then I understand it. And then I automatically understand my location in the social hierarchy. I'm better. I'm worse. Done. Nothing to think about. So the brain is naturally prone to what I what I was talking about as compression, where you compress and you compress things. And that's just basically live. As I understand, I'm no Levinas uh, expert, so I appreciate the work you're doing, Dave, on the notion of totality. So the brain finds totality pleasurable because it's pleasurable to understand. And as we learned from Mr. Peirce uh, in Ethics of Belief, the brain is primarily in the business of getting rid of that horrible itch of not understanding. Well, totality gets rid of that itch. Likewise, saying that greatness is just there or not gets rid of that itch. And everything is gradually turned into algebraic because it is more pleasurable. This means rationality is in service of pleasure in this kind of reductionist way. Now, we're not saying pleasure is bad and work is good, but there's a higher form of joy that is possible through effort. But the brain can't even conceive that if it is stuck in a form of com compression, that then here's the key. What we like, you know, we like compression. And James K.A. Smith has a lovely book where he says, you are what you love. And what he means is that we love tends to form our habits. So when we love something, we tend to form habits around it. And that thus translates into our character. Here's the problem. When we compress everything, which we enjoy because it makes it understandable, then we come to create habits around that compression. And then the compression, the inevitable, because like you were saying, Dave, with Levinas, totality, all language, all thought, everything has a tendency toward totality, right? Which also means it's uh, naturally toward cutting us off from Heidegger's origin, as I'll call it, grounds of intelligibility. Everything is naturally toward cutting us off from the origin. Well, here's the problem. It's pleasurable to cut ourselves off from the origin because that creates understanding. Then we create habits around doing that. And then in those habits, compression becomes a permanent flattening and we all become cartoon characters, as we were saying last time, and then lose the capacity to know that we have flattened everything into car cartoon characters. And then reality becomes algebraic, objectively, quote unquote, because we lose the capacity to think an alternative. And so this is why it becomes extremely important to resist the natural tendencies of the brain, which requires us to believe in effort, process, geometry, as opposed to just magic. It just is or it is not. Now, um, it's very interesting, too, because there's something about as well that if you entertain the category of, I'll say, effort versus maybe I'll say work, where in capitalism, you can have work, you can have a job, but you can't do effort. OK, well, work then is intelligible, OK, because it's within the system of getting a job and it's paid for it. Effort is not intelligible. Why in the world would you be reading these books so closely if you're not getting paid for it or anything? So effort is not intelligible. It is precisely because it is not intelligible that it is then the road back to the origin. It is then the road outside of the logic of capital, which then creates a kind of game theory dynamic where if everyone does what is rational, they end up in a suboptimal result. It is outside of that. But you see, here's the trick. I think there's a difference. There is this kind of idea today that, oh, we have to get out. We have to get outside of cap. We have to get outside of the system. We have to rebel. You know, there's kind of that emphasis, right? Here's the problem. The real revolution is from algebra to geometry. And the problem is without process and effort, there is no possibility of geometry. You are stuck in algebra. You can be individually expressing yourself all day long. You can be doing your own, you know, your own kind of individualization or your own kind of like pleasure principles. But here's the problem. If it is algebraic, it is not a revolution. It is still in service of the point thought or the totality that has led to the Nash equilibrium. So this means the following. The only way basically to have a real revolution or a real reformation has to be something more geometrical and meaningfully geometrical. That's a process, that's effort, that's time. You're now bringing a temporality into the picture, right? But it's a temporality that is not merely the passing of clock time, but a structuring of the subject, almost in the Lacanian time, that then opens up the horizon of geometry, which then necessitates the revelation that you are an active subject in the interpretation of intelligibility, ergo, we're back to the origin. Without process, you cannot individuate in a manner that is non-algebraic, thus outside the logic that is capturing people, thus unveiling the origin that we need in order to actually have an intelligible and real transformation of the system into geometry, thus instead of a 2D cartoon character, which is algebraic, a full human being. 
So pro because it's also processed in a meaningful way. You know, it's not going to do simply to have the passage of time, right? There has to be a building of time. There's a, right? Well, the only way that's a building of time is effort, compounding. So building of time, here's the key. When you're building time, you're changing it from something algebraic, one, two, three, four, sequential, you know, spurious infinity. When you're building time, you're giving it what? Dimensions. It's becoming geometrical. So now you have something that can be infinitely building as opposed to sections of totalities. Because here's the irony. Clock time is just one totality following the next. One minute totality, two minute totality, three minute totality, four minute totality. If all you have is the passage of time, it's just the following of a sequence of totalities. In order to get an infinity, you have to be building on time. And that requires effort. And if you do not do that, you cannot have a real revolution to a new grounds of intelligibility in terms of geometry, which will be getting to terms to origin, which will be getting to the possibility of the structuring of a subject in a manner that is able to handle the anxiety of that very origin. And reading is a great way to do that. <laughs> I take it you like math. No, actually, me, Panther, there in the chat said, I'm going to go out on a limb by guessing that Daniel loves Plato and Aristotle. Um, is that true? Do you love Plato and Aristotle? I, 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 I never want, I have a great, great respect for the founding members, you know, to disown the fathers means there's probably some pathology. I do think that Plato is mostly cheaply read. And I, I think uh, Aristotle actually needs to be read in terms of phenomenology. And good, to see good. all of his books as part mm -hmm. of a progression, not merely separated books that have nothing to do with one another. So I'd like to talk about Aristotle's chain. And I think it's important to understand that Plato's forms are not idealistic versions, but more like the orbits of planets, according to which things formulate. So I think there's a lot to be learned in those thinkers. Yeah, which is really good because I've been thinking a lot about ideals um, and how they're real. And yeah, we I even think there's a way to argue that they are objective. Um, in their form, in their form, not in their content. And uh, I just did a little impromptu lecture on that yesterday uh, for some, my students because, you know, the, the class, the topic is, is college worth it? And uh, your lovely wife, Michelle Garner, there in the chat, actually just interviewed mine uh, and Snellgrove McCarricker, and that they both had this conversation that just went up on Spotify last night. And so the interview was yesterday. It went from interview to publish like so fast turnaround. I was like, whoa, my God. And so I listened to most of it actually this morning before getting going with this stream. I was like, it was like at 4.30, 5 a.m. I was listening to it while getting set up, you know. Um, and uh, where am I going with this? I wanted to say, oh, yeah. So they were talking about this course. Uh, is college worth it? And Anne is, has been a discussion leader for it, an adjunct. Um, instructor for this course and you know it's like a hundred students and then there's the breakout sessions and the breakout sessions is arguably like the most important part it's where the, the 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 bigger plenary lecture is sort of digested but also there is like this you know outside of the discussion component there is you know on the adjunct instructor like this responsibility to kind of contextualize things and to kind of like bring it make it more meaningful for for the students in this smaller group capacity and so um, you know, that gives me a lot of license, which is nice because like with my second version of that class, I was just kind of, I was already, I was hungry and I kind of just spent more time in the discuss discussion mode, getting them to talk amongst themselves and stuff like that. You know, whereas in the first I was on fire, man, but I was going off about this idea of uh, the ideal, uh, student right? This, this is something that gets talked about uh, at Boise State, uh, specifically in this course. Yeah, Anne helped, by the way, put this course together when she was still a student. She was actually there building this course out with uh, the, the main professor. Um, and so I wanted to give her that credit. But the, uh, one of the things that they do from this sort of sociological background is to say that the ideal learner is a social construction. And that it is, you know, we, we lose touch with uh, the fact that, uh, you know, this ideal that we're holding ourselves up against might not really be, one, based in reality, two, realistic, and three, that it might, uh, it might be classed, 
It might be racialized. It might be uh, all of these different things. So, for instance, if the ideal student is easily able to uproot and go to a different university, this is the language they use. I don't. I mean, literally, the professor uses that language of uprooting, which is funny because I don't realize that they understand the connotations there. But, um, but yes, this this globalizing uprooting. You know, no, that, that's actually what's going on there, right? It's just, but the ideal model is like the the person who's able to just leave. Uh, leave their family, leave their, their hometown, like whatever, right? And so uh, not everyone's able to do that, right? The ideal student also lives on campus. Not everyone's able to do that. Uh, the ideal student gets involved with everything because they don't have to work a job, right? So you go down this, this line of things. And so, you know, the takeaway from it, I mean, there's time constraints on the lectures. Who knows how much more nuance we could have gotten into, uh, but where it was left at is it's a social construction. It's made up. It's bullshit. Don't beat yourselves up, kids. You know, and that was kind of the professor's position. And I was like asking them about, you know, the idea of well, the, the question itself is college worth it? You know, um, and one of the things that I was getting from everyone's thinking about this so far is that this is relative and or subjective and that people are using these two terms really to say therefore kind of make it what you want it's unimportant which to me is a huge problem I mean, you've read time energy so you obviously know there's a section in there where i take on this idea that the subjective is somehow less real or or whatever or that it's just pure fancy or or feeling um and so what i was bringing in was like the idea that yeah. So at the subjective level, there's whim, there's fancy, there's will, there's desire, there's bias, there's standpoint, all of these things. And, you know, students, I was getting the students to kind of answer those things out. Right. Um, but then I was like, well, wh what about relative? What's different with relative, the word relative? And the thing is, is all of their answers to the word relative were the same as their answers to the word subjective. And the interesting thing about that is like, well, yeah when we're talking about something being in reference to the self in that case then sure it's subjective in a sort of sense but of course you also have objective needs and those are in relation to the self and you could say that your feelings about those are subjective and you could say that your desires about those are subjective but that doesn't make them less real right in fact and then so then i use that to kind of like scale out the idea of relativity well what else is this question is college worth it relative to and so we get into things such as community family society uh goals standards and then because of goals and standards i get into ideals and then i tie ideals back into uh the ideal student and then i say even if it is a social construction is it not and it, you know, is, is it not real? So let's just say that the, the content of the ideal student is bullshit. Let's just, let's just say it's completely made up by the, the, the McDonaldization of the university. Does that mean that the form of the ideal student is therefore also just constructed in bullshit? And my answer would be no, because there are objective needs and requirements for having a society, for having a community, for having a culture, for having a family, for having a self, for having any kind of meaningful relations within any of those things, right? That means that the ideal student as a form is objective in some sense because it actually holds together your ability to navigate and maintain or build, because you might not even have, all of those things. And so just this is I, I only went so far into the details of this because, first of all, it relates to the whole conversation about is college worth it? I want everybody to check out that conversation between Michelle and Anne. We will link it in the description and in the live chat in a minute. Um, but also because ideals do relate uh, and they're, they're relative to situations and two certain objectives, and two certain questions such as the good life, or whatever, but that we are creatures for whom ideals matter. And so there is this kind of naive 
materialistic approach that just says, oh, anything in language, anything in ideas, anything in philosophy, it's all just idealism. That doesn't matter. Viva la revolution. Let's go. Let's go. Material, material. Let's change. Let's change. And it's like, yeah, but if you don't realize that the human creature is a creature for whom ideals are real and matter and, and in a material way, then we're fucked. And so using that all then to set you up, I want to hear your Neoplatonism a little bit more. In reference to, in reference to kind of how I'm talking about it, where you probably go in some other direction. Who knows? I just want to see. Oh, delightful. So a few things come to mind. Um, your ideals must have the possibility of proving you wrong. The issue is that people have ideals that can't prove them wrong. Flannery O'Connor also had a lovely line where he said, she said, the truth will set you free by making you weird. The problem is we have ideals that don't make us weird, as in other, as in different from the logic of the society, which means we're then stuck in service of, say, the Nash equilibrium. So uh, the problem is a lot of times when you hear people critiquing ideals or different things like that, they're critiquing the algebraic version of it or the form version of it, which then is a version that exists because of the system of algebraic exclusivity that the university system may have come to teach. So then it's identifying a problem with a problem that creates because of the, the modes of thinking that it is created that cuts you off from the origin, right? So there is a problem with an ideal that is a point that puts you outside of relation and that puts you outside of cost to yourself. If my ideal is to have power over everyone else or to have a position that then reifies the system of exclusion or that keeps people poor or whatever or so forth, this is a problem. But if my ideal forces me to work against the structure of rationality that is keeping me entrapped and thus makes me weird and thus makes me feel wrong because you're going to feel wrong if you're trying to operate outside of the logic of careerism or whatever so forth. This is a valuable idea. Ideal. So the key is to have ideals that make you strange, ergo non-rational. And you see, basically, the point of, in my opinion, the point of the university uh, should be to help people avoid Nash equilibria. Um, in a sense, the university should exist to help the universe from being suboptimal. And what I mean by a Nash equilibrium is the notion that, um, and I spoke with my beloved uh, Lorenzo about this, another term for it is I call it a rational impasse, which is a situation that if everyone is rational, you end up with a suboptimal result. And there's that lovely scene in the movie Beautiful Mind where John Nash is saying, if we all go for the prettiest girl in the bar, we don't get any dates. So the best outcome is actually to go for the not as pretty girl in the bar, right? So it seems, but here's the problem. Game theory is taught as, well, actually, that just means that the most rational thing to do is to go for the other girls, not the most beautiful. This is a terrible, in my opinion, interpretation because you're moving it to the systems layer level away from the individual experience. The individual experience is that you're doing something crazy. You're doing something non-rational. Now, here's the key. What is non-rational at the time feels irrational, but actually it's non-rational because it opens you up to the optimal result. So there's a difference between rational, irrational, and non-rational, okay? And the non-rational is what gets you out of a rational impasse and how you get an optimal result that is beyond the horizon that is given you by the mode of intelligibility that you have absorbed. OK, so the non-rational is always what gets you closer to the origin. I'm using origin in line with Heidegger, the grounds of intelligibility, which without the non-rational, it is inevitable that you are cut off from the origin because rationality ultimately always becomes a structure that reifies itself by its own assumptions of what constitutes the good life. So the function of the university should be to keep people out of rational impasses individually, societally, everything, which means it gives you the ability to identify non-rational decision-making, which requires bravery, courage, discernment, wrestling, effort. The moment you start talking about non-rationality, by definition, it's geometrical. By definition, because there has to be an entire situation that does not give you in its facticity the, rest, the correct course of action, you have to think about it. When you go into that beautiful mind example, the facticity tells you go for this girl. But if you think about it, 
ergo Leibniz situation, you go, actually, that's not the best result because then nobody's going to get a date this evening. Like the prisoner's dilemma, all these things. You step back as an active unit and condition the situation non-rationally to make possible the best result. This is the function of the university. This is the function of defining the form according to which to formulate in an ideal fashion that does not lead to a rational impasse. And I basically think I'm not an expert on Neoplatonism or anything like that, but I have a notion that basically there is something about the grounds of intelligibility found in the one that is a way to access the one that we're often cut off from because our notions of intelligibility are separated from the one, therefore they're suboptimal as opposed to non-rational. Now, this would require me different th to go into different things, um, but I would also note one of the keys, like you're talking about the subjective versus the objective divide, et cetera, so forth. The word subjective is an algebraic term automatically. So the moment you use that language, you're off because there's a point, the subject, independent of the objective. Well, that's algebraic. So the language is incorrect automatically. And this is the problem. You must pay attention. Uh, so advice for reading, uh, you know, and talking, you must pay attention to the background assumed by the term in order for it to be intelligible. The only way the word subjective is intelligible is as a term that makes you independent of situation. There's no such thing as a world independent of situation. Therefore, this term is a problem. Maybe there's another word we need to look for. I like to talk about conditionalism. And what I mean by that is I have in mind, say, in praise of, let me make an example because I think the Japanese philosophers are good at this. Um, so in praise of shadows, what is a shadow? A shadow, is possible because you have an object blocking light. It's conditioned to create a certain effect. You, in archaeology, he talks a lot about in Praise of Shadows of Architecture, you have to design the room in a certain way so that shadows are created. Well, this is very interesting because it's a combination of a human with objects. You are conditioning the environment to create a certain effect. Conditionalism is the middle ground, if you will, between subject and objective thinking. And the truth of the matter is that we are perpetually undergoing conditionalism. I like the word condition, too, because that's like going to the gym. When you read a book, you're conditioning yourself to experience the world in a different condition, back and forth, back and forth. Conditionalism is the truth of reality. And it's also like a veil. Like, there's a lot of things like this. Like, think about a work of art. A work of art is like a painting is a giant testament to conditionalism. You have to get all the, the paint in the right spot, in the right location, one false move. One, if, if Van Gogh is doing a paint and he goes, oops, the whole thing is ruined. So it has to be perfectly, skillfully conditioned, which must be a process. There's no way you get conditionalism without a process, ergo effort, that then if you are successful, creates a what? An effect, painting. The subject-object divide does not exist in the work of art. There, it, it's, it's meaningless to discuss about those differences because the subject conditions the object to be a certain way that then conditions them to be capable of so conditioning reality back and forth and back and forth. If there is truth to the idea, if by subjective, you mean a algebraic entity separate from situation that just interprets reality, yeah, that's a problem, but there's no such thing as just interpreting reality. There is conditioning reality, but not like a voodoo magic trick. There is conditioning reality through what? Time. Effort is the magic. The only way to have the magic transformation of objective reality is according to the effort of conditioning it, which in turn conditions yourself to be capable of so conditioning reality and experiencing it in accordance with that higher, more earned conditionality. And that's, I think, when we talk about object, you know, when people said um, objective, what they meant is, you know how we talk about my objective today is to eat lunch? It meant a process. There's something to get to. That would be one thing. But you see, what the if, if by objective, we said you need to be objective, if by that we meant you need to make your object getting to the thing itself, which, by the way, you suck at getting at because you're stuck in totality instead of infinity, thus meaning your objective is to get to the infinity of things, that would be one thing. But that's not what we mean. We mean objective, generally, we mean objective as an in independent of subjective involvement. But the funny thing about this is that there is no such thing as, as points or objects independent of subjective conditioning. They all exist relative to subjective conditioning. Because the moment you say, even if you take a tree, 
which exists without human beings. The moment you say tree, you have conditioned it according to the intelligibility of the word tree. So it's so to talk about intelligibility without human involvement, I don't want to say is to talk about nothing, but it is to talk about something instantly within a human intelligibility of which what you're trying to do is say human intelligibility. Now back out, human. Back out quickly. Back out as quickly as you can. Well, guess what? Here's the funny thing about that. The closest we can get to objectivity is through a process called the scientific method. There's only one way we've ever kind of gotten close to something like regular regularity in, in, in result, the scientific method. But that's a process, not an algebraic uh, comprehension. You do a process of saying, every time we drop the ball, it seems to fall. Okay, there's a process that then gives you not certainty, but reason to think that balls tend to fall when you drop them. But do note, if you were on the moon and dropped a ball, it would float. So the law of nature would be a little different, right? So even that is kind of conditioned. But there's something about science giving you a relative reliability, but that reliability is a result of a process, not an instantaneous, not an instantaneous effortless apprehension of things in their facticity, right? There is no such thing as reliability without process. So here's the thing. If you want to be a reliable human being, it's going to take some effort. If you want to be a reliable human being that's able to reliably comprehend and experience reality according to higher conditionalities, it's going to require effort regularly, which then creates that process of conditioning. So I think basically, and then I guess the last thing I'll say, and then I'll give it back to you, is we just simply don't ever experience thinking in terms of points. Like think about, like it's always geometrical, which would then create, re which would then create reason to think this geometrical conception of human life is more accurate. Because think about when you dream. Has anyone ever dreamed not a world? Like just a thing floating in some sort of vacuum, right? Thinking always worlds. It always seeks a world to contextualize the point so that is intelligible. You can't, and here's the funny thing about a dream. A dream shows you that even when you're not experiencing the world, thought naturally seeks a world, right? Because it creates a context of what makes points intelligible. So when you're talking about, oh, you need to be objective, as if it's possible for thought to not world, as if it's possible for intellig intelligibility to create points that are independent of relation, there's no such thought. We don't even see it in dreams. The key is not to leave the subject behind, but to figure out how to condition the worlding of thoughts with the world that thought is making intelligible in a manner that makes it more of an infinity than a totality, but that requires effort and work because the brain is not naturally so conditioned. The, natu the brain is naturally conditioned according to the, prin the pleasure principle to seek an understanding that turns a compression into a flattening, and then you lose the capacity to know it's even been flattened. So I think it, you have to work against those tendencies. That's very well said. Yeah. Conditionalism. I'm a condition. I'm a conditionalist and I didn't even know it. I'm, I'm, I'm 100 percent, 100 percent down with that. And honestly, all of the thinkers I think that we like are conditionalists in, in their own ways. You, you could write a great book, I'm sure, called Conditionalism, A History of Continental Philosophy and a Critique of Analytic. You know, I don't know. Maybe analytics are learning conditionalism. I don't know. I've not I'm not hip with everything right now, but when I was in an analytic department and I was wondering what the hell they were all talking about, when I, whenever I could figure it out, I was like, oh, the reason I'm so confused is because they don't care about condition. They don't care about structure. They don't care about environment. They don't care about context. They don't care about history. They don't care. And I'm like, how the fuck do you guys not care about all this stuff? I, you, I don't know. They're doing very important work. I, I, I believe, I believe it. I just don't understand it. I need to. That's part of my longer life you know, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not responsible for having to really square that circle. I am, uh, in my own journey, I have to figure it out because they care about epistemology. Continental philosophers don't. I think that that actually matters. It, what's real doesn't fucking matter if we're not also thinking about how do we know what's real? And also the expanded definition of we. In that case, how do we know gets us into social epistemology? And then, of course, because the conditions for knowing together are so problematic today, that's why we get into critical social epistemology, which is a course that will hopefully be taught here at Theory Underground next year by Samuel Lonkar of Becoming Human.
He is the vanishing mediator of this conversation. He was going to be here. And that was the original goal was to introduce you to. And I wanted to see what would happen around questions as to the human post humanism, trans humanism, you know, wh whether the human is something worth preserving or not. Uh, it, like the whole thing. I was really excited for that conversation, but it has been moved, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone else to February 22nd at the exact same time that this session is happening at. So the next big epic marathon stream at theory underground is going to be on february 22nd and we're going to be cut all things assuming all things go well right um uh, we'll be doing it with uh with daniel with samuel uh nance and a whole bunch of other people uh by the way i've got you got a bunch of love coming at you from the comment section people are saying that your energy is infectious even nance said dude i fucking love daniel with like i don't know a lot of exclamation points um martin heidegger said who is daniel well, Daniel is this OG Rose guy you see here on the screen. He is one half of OG Rose. Michelle Garner in the chat is the other half. I shared a link to the interview where Michelle is interviewing Anne, my wife. So that it was, it, I think it was called Cute Theory Couples is the name of their, it's, it's called Cute Theory Couples and uh, Critique of Education or something like that. And so uh, definitely check that out. And uh, Me Panthers said that you are the Goggins of philosophy. Damn, I was going for that title, but you, it's true. You've won. You've won. You get it. Hats off. But um, I want to get into uh, Waypoint. I want to get into the idea of sustained effort and how the condition of sustained effort is time energy. But of course, there's also like this sort of reciprocally determinative relationship there where we could also then say that time that sustained effort is also the condition of time energy itself, um, that this is a kind of time that has to be built, that this is geometric time, as opposed to the point time that we deal with is this algebraic time, uh, and that is the time of the clock, it's the time of the bus, it's the time of labor power, um, but we can't get into that. We don't have time to get into that, and so that's me, I just gave you all the cliff notes of a conversation that I hope to have with Daniel. Um, there is an opening later today. Maybe we could bring you back on. I'll send you the, the time. We could see if that would work. But I wanted to give it over here to Nance to say some stuff. I don't know. You guys got like a full on like six minutes here. Nance, I'm hoping that you can kind of just reflect on all of this stuff. Uh, if you want to turn it into a question or not, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to go get some more of my decaffeinated coffee you think after a conversation with daniel that i need caffeine no no i said i'm doing this naturally today so i'll be right back i'll be listening so actually i, I do have a, a quick question before hopefully we can just go a little back and forth but every time we talk i want to ask you if you know who hanu rajanimi is no i do not I, I i need to apparently He's a Finnish, um, <clears throat> Finnish mathematician who does some interesting stuff with game theory, and I he interests me. He he writes math and he also writes fiction, um, but he's interested. And it, it every time I always go there when when you get going. Um, oh. But I I love the subjectlessness. I've a lot of the time I just kind of make recourse to saying things are super subjective. Um, and I kind of use that as a defeater for the binary position of subjective and objective. Um, because everything is conditional. Everything is contextual. Everything does depend on the structure that supports what it is um, outside of ideal forms. And actually another thing I, uh, I read the Timaeus a few months ago and I was, and I've been trying to convince Dave that we need to read the Timaeus. And I, I think you helped do that. I, I, I do think um, I want to engage more seriously with Plato. Um, and I think, of course, I don't know. I just, it, I love it, man. I think there's a lot of synergy going on. Um, maybe it's zeitgeist. Maybe it's great minds think alike. I don't know what it is. Um, but effort um conditions of possibility conditions of intelligibility background environment um all of it it's it just kind of screams to me in a way that like of course this is the case but it seems like institutions don't want us to be able to engage with these deep structures um 
of all the things that are in our world. They, they want us to be very superficial. They, they want us to interact with appearances, with surfaces. Um, and it's not like they, you know, it, it is just the market logic. Like things have to be algebraic points rather than kind of like dense interconnected nodes in a web of, of just interdependent. I don't know. I don't want to get too delusional. And we were, <laughs> but, but it is like, everything is flowing. Everything is constantly in flux. Um, nothing is concrete and we shouldn't settle uh, when we're being told that things are always just kind of concrete objectivities in themselves. Um, and I love it, man. I, I, I really do. Every time we talk it, I just, I get so amped. Um, cause you just have like a, a, a thirst for knowledge that it really is infectious. Like it, 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 it truly is. I, I need to go read. I need to go write. Like I, I'm on fire right now. Thank you so much. Well, goodness, Nance, that means the world. And, uh, you know, a few things first, thank you for that reference. I always appreciate that. I'll look that up. That's wonderful. Um, second, I, I think one of the, re there are people that talk about like relations, you know, a whitehead, you know, Deleuze, um, different things like that. The issue is a reason I like conditionalism because that's relation with effort, you know, condition is like a gem. And one of the things that can happen is if you take seriously that re relations are ontological, but you don't condition yourself to be ready for that reality, you can be overwhelmed by what Lacan says the real. So there's a certain work that has to occur, which makes me think of, I guess, Canto 21 in the Paradiso where Beatrice is with Dante. And Dante's like, why won't you smile? And Beatrice is like, well, at this point, if I smile, it will reduce you to ash. Heaven will suddenly become Lovecraft. Likewise, there's a certain work Dante has to go through to get to the place where he can handle more joy, ergo relation, ergo more that. So we have to think about effort. And I do think that if we're going to emphasize relation, which I do think is deepest reality because it's geometrical then it must be paired with a notion of effort and that gets into things like reading and work and indeed i think there was you know samuel you know like his work on the on kuhn is extraordinary and that that's exactly what he's putting forth with kuhn is a kind of relational structure of science a process that's what we have to think this is all process process is relation plus effort and that is what we have to think to condition ourselves ready for it and, um, and the last thing I will say, um, and I also think there's a lot to be talked about with Michel Planier, with personal knowledge. I think there was an entire movement of philosophy that I call the modern counter-enlightenment that was missed with your Fondains, your Blondels, your Planiers, the Japanese philosophers who get into this, but they were overlooked. Because when the um, tyranny of algebra takes over, anyone who's introducing geometry gets ignored from the conversation, and that's a problem. But the last thing I was going to say as before we go, and this has been a treat, and I always really look forward to speaking with you, is um, one of the things on the concept of reading when i try to write a paper or i read a book i try to imagine that thinker over my shoulder or giving them the paper and the reason i do is because we all when we're talking with people that agree with us we tend to kind of silo and our thinking gets kind of lame just like you become a little lazy in conversation but when you speak with someone different you become a little more thoughtful likewise i never want to write a paper on marx that if i hand it to marx he would read and look up at me and say do you really think i'm this stupid like, do you really think I'm this dumb and wouldn't have thought of this? Like, in like Leibniz, Hume, and to me, when you think about writing and reading, as I'm going to tell the writer what I think their book means, it calls you to a higher standard, and it calls you to working uh, a little bit deeper. And what I wanted to say is I think that if Marx was to receive a paper on the work that you've done so far, he'd be like, this is wonderful. So well done to you, because that's not easy to achieve. But Nance, this has been a pleasure. Best of luck with the best of the live stream. I always enjoy it very much, my friend. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, we actually, this Monday, we we had a really interesting uh, occurrence that went down on our Capital Mondays. Um, dude, 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 dude. And... I was like, I was like, you cannot leave before we tell you what happened because you were just saying all of this stuff. So, Nance, you're going right where I was hoping you would go because I was like running upstairs. I was like, I can't miss Daniel saying goodbye. Oh, no. <laughs> OK, damn Keurig. It takes we, so long. We we had a moment where um, I, I, I we were challenged. Um, we were called upon to um, return to the spirit of the task, which we undertook because I I. I had gotten a bit lazy. Uh, I think Dave would tell you that he himself, he felt he had got a bit lazy and we had an interesting opportunity to uh, raise our standards, raise our effort. And I do think it was successful. I think coming out of the back end of it, um, it ultimately ended in an amicable disagreement that um, I think we have buy-in to 
to to stay engaged. Um, but I already feel like the challenge that I bring um, to defend my initial position is already stronger because I've spent, you know, I spent a few hours the other day talking about it and I've spent a few days thinking about it at the background. Um, and that just, I guess the form of what we're doing is um, demanding this effort in in uh in the pursuit of excellence you know i i, I don't ever want to um believe that that will be achieved I, I think it will be an ongoing unending effort um and i'm excited for for that episode to come out because it was it was great and it was very ser serendipitous too um so for people who are into um coincidence and serendipity i think it'll be a pleasant surprise as well oh well that sounds magnificent and uh, i look forward to it well by putting yourself with the person who disagrees, form becomes formulation. You move from an algebraic thinking with yourself to a geometric situation where form becomes formulation. And without that formulation, then we can't develop to the fullness of the human being. So I, I look forward to that. And gentlemen, I enjoyed this immensely. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Nance. It's, been a, it's really been a treat. Thank you so much for being here. It was an honor. Take care. Best to you, gentlemen. All the best. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of the bullshit and just want to get down to it. Big ideas, rigorous thinking, and ultimately liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. Besides a commitment to publishing certain underground theorists and popularizing certain fundamental concepts, we have toured the United States and are touring Europe to promote our ideas, courses, and publications. You've been reading Underground Theory. Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run a review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture this scene. America, early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics, and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, a teaching, research, and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts, and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker, and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek. Uh, uh, uh. My Bible, it's an excellent book. Also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book, a collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of The Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing, but first, obviously, I have to get freed myself so the two of us are able to do this because, you know, as Mikey said, build it and they will come. Well, I tried and I built a website and platform. Uh, I had my own app and everything, but it's been really buggy and uh, it's more than one person can handle. And that's, you know what, a really good lesson for me. And so for now, what we're doing is moving it to a temporary intermediary platform until we are able to get some more serious funding. And ultimately, we want to 
be in a place like this, a real brick and mortar digital nomadic mecca where people can come from all over the world, but also the app was really expensive. And so by quitting it, I am now able to save a lot of money. And with the help of my patrons and the students at Theory Underground, especially the monthly subscribers, I am officially able to quit Amazon <laughs> and do Theory Underground full time. So thank you so much, everybody. This is one huge step forward. My way of giving back to everybody is by promoting everyone who is at a current tier to the benefits of the tier above them, as far as subscribers go, and also rolling out a new lower tier. And so check out the tier subscription setup and if you're not interested in taking the courses or what's being offered for subscribers and you want to support anyway, check out the Patreon. Finally, just stay tuned for more information on the tour in Europe during the month of May 2024 and the conference in Mexico during the last weekend of October 2024. If you want to be there, hit me up ASAP. Let's get talking because it's happening very soon. All right. Bye-bye.